Well, go ahead and make your way back to your seat at this time, if you would. We don't know what day it was. Uh, we don't know what Jesus was doing at the time. But we do know this. We do know that a day came when he untied the apron strings that he would have worn as a carpenter. And he took his apron and he set it on the countertop and he walked out of the carpenter shop and began his ministry. We don't know what it was that, that, that sparked that day. We don't know what it was that brought Jesus to that place in his life in which God the Father prompted him to step forward and take that next step. But we do know this. We do know that the day came. And the very first place, according to the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus went was a river. He went to the Jordan River. And this is my guess, that if Jesus were physically present with us, and he could stand before us, and we could interview him and ask him this question, if we could ask him who was the most important preacher of his day, the most influential teacher in his life, I, I am so confident that he would say John the Baptist. Because the connection that we see between these two men is an extraordinary type of connection within Scripture. My guess is, is that there was no single human person in the life of Jesus more influential on his ministry than John. And I want to read for you from the Gospel of Mark, beginning here in verse 1. And we're going to read the first eight verses. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, and they'll be up on the screen behind me as well. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And all of the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and he wore a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You know what's interesting about that passage is this. This in particular to me, it begins in this way. Mark begins his gospel with these words. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. My expectation would be the next word out of, out of, John, out of Mark's pen here would be Jesus came. But that's not what he says. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the next word is, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send a messenger who will prepare the way. You would think the thing that, John, that, that Mark is going to do in talking about Jesus is not exactly what he does. And he starts to tell us about John. And so, this is what I want us to do here this morning. We're just going to kind of glide through this passage here and just make a few observations. So what I want us to do is just take a couple of moments here and consider why John the Baptist is important to Jesus. All right? So I'm going to ask you guys a question, more of a rhetorical type of question, but I want you to try to visualize this with me. And I'm going to do my very best to describe John the Baptist, I, I think, in a fair way. Okay? How many of you like outspoken, hairy men who seem to be antisocial? Okay? Anybody? I got one, <laughs> I've got one person raising her hand back there, and I, and I see why, actually. <laughs> But that's the question to consider when it comes to John the Baptist. Here he is. John is a man of about 30 years of age. He's about six months older than Jesus. They're cousins. Uh, the other Gospels tell us that they're cousins. Um, so they're really close in age. We don't know if they grew up together. We really don't know a lot of details concerning their connection. But from the description that we have of John the Baptist, we do know this, is that John had taken what was called a Nazarite vow. 
Okay, if you grew up Nazarene, this is not the same thing, all right? This is a Jewish custom. This is a vow that we see in Old Testament Scripture. And it appears that John was one of these people that had taken this Nazarite vow. And part of taking a Nazarite vow, uh, one of the primary physical things that you would notice is they never cut their hair, ever, right? Now I want you to picture this. I want you to picture long hair on his head. I know I'm making this difficult for you because you don't have a, a comparison point here. I almost did long hair, but we have no standard to start with, okay? So I want you to picture long hair, and I want you to picture a long beard. For those of you who grew up in the 70s and 80s, think of ZZ, okay? But not cut, long beard, long beard, long hair. And I don't want you to imagine pretty long hair, okay? I want you to imagine a guy who's been in a warm desert and he's windblown and he's sunburned and his hair is long and his beard is long. I want you to picture desert long hair, okay? This is John. Now, it's not to say he wasn't clean because I'm sure he was, but I need you to have the image of somebody who is weathered and somebody who is worn and somebody whose hair is long and whose beard is long. This is his primary message. You are all sinners and you need to repent. That's his primary message. And people come out to him in droves to hear him. He named names. He called people out for what they did. So much so that later in the Gospel of Mark we find out that he called out Herod for his own sins by name. And Herod didn't want to do anything about it until somebody in his family manipulated it. From the mind of the people, he is an antisocial, long-haired, outspoken guy in the desert that people can't get enough of. And the authorities don't really know what to do with them. That's John. He ate locusts. You guys know what locusts is? Yeah? If you don't, just picture a big fat grasshopper, okay? And wild honey that he did not get out of a bottle. That means he went and raided beehives. This is John. You got the image in your mind now? And Jesus, his first thing in his ministry is that he goes out to John. And he finds John out at a very small river in the desert. And the crowds can't get enough of this man. The crowds keep coming out to him to hear his message. And John was so influential on the life of Jesus. But according to the Gospel of John, and uh, Gospel of Mark, until John's ministry was over by his death, by his, by his arrest and his death, Jesus didn't even begin his ministry. Look at it with me. Verse 14 of chapter 1. Now after John was arrested... Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. But look at his message and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Whose message does that sound like? John. And yet the very message that John was preaching was the same message that Jesus was preaching. And so we have this picture oftentimes in our mind of Jesus as, as very soft and very gentle and very polished. And yet according to Mark in his gospel, Jesus' message began in the footsteps of what God had done within John. And here is John, the man in the wilderness... The guy in the wilderness that nobody knows what to do with. And the crowds come out to him and he's saying, Repent. Repent and turn from your sin. That's the message. And Jesus' ministry begins with those words. Look at them here in, again in verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Okay, so there's, there's John's message. It can be summed up in the word repent. My guess is the word repent does not mean exactly what most of us in the room think the word repent means. Okay, so let me give you an image. I was about um, 10. 
I'm trying to remember exactly what age I was, but I'm going to say 10, about fourth grade. And um, in my neighborhood, there weren't any other boys my age. Everybody was older than me. So I grew up playing with all the boys who were two to three years older than me. And um, we played rough. We were just typical boys, uh, tackled each other, uh, knocked each other down, um, you know, just classic kind of upbringing. And I was two years younger than the guys closest in age to me. And so I had to, I had to man up. And, and to, in order to play with these kids. And uh, there were two boys that I was playing with one day. One day. Their names were Bob and Trampus. Anybody, anybody by the name of Trampus before? Yeah, Bob and Trampus. And uh, Bob was always really nice to me. Trampus was friends with Bob, and so we kind of got along through that way. And uh, he was being real braggy one day and was, was uh, showing his new shoes and his new tennis shoes, and we were standing by a creek and apparently, I'm not sure what got into me, but I landed Trampus in the creek on purpose and uh, realized very quickly the error of my ways and uh, turned and ran as fast as I could run <laughs> because I was going to receive the beating of my life. And he could do it. And uh, I outran him to my house. And I remember I ran through the front door and pulled the door behind me as he was coming up on the steps and I got the door shut and locked. And I lived in fear for a couple of days and somehow Trampus and I reconciled and he didn't do anything bad to me. I found him, I apologized and he was extremely gracious about it. He was extremely nice about it and I, and I commend him for that because most 12 year old boys wouldn't have been. But that image in that moment is the image that I want you to have. That moment of wrongdoing <laughs> and an immediate pivot, an immediate turning, and a fleeing. That, that's the word repent. See, we have this notion in our minds that the word repent means to be sorry, to be apologetic. That's actually not the biblical definition of repent. Uh, there's a scripture that says that it is godly sorrow that leads us to repentance. It's not repentance. It leads us to repentance. And um, we think of repentance as we wished something wouldn't have happened. That's sorrow. That's not repentance. Biblically, what repentance is, and the way John was using the word repentance, was in this way. It's the very course of life changes. The very direction of life is altered. So when he's saying to his crowds, when they're coming out to him in the river, he says this to them. He's preaching a baptism of repentance. And Jesus says in these words in verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Both of them are saying this. The course of your life must alter. The course of your life must change. And what's fascinating to me about that message and about John is this, is that people came from everywhere to hear John. There's nothing that appealing about John's appearance. There's nothing that appealing to the human psyche about what it is that John has to say. There's no wonderful comments that he's giving them to build them up. He's not doing anything that we would think of that would draw an audience out to him because he's not coming to them. They are coming to him. And his message is a message of repentance. He's not a politician who's trying to make yes sound like no or no sound like yes. He's not covering, he's not polishing his words, he's not doing anything except preaching a, a message of repentance and they would get it. They would understand what that message of repentance really meant. They would get this idea that what John was calling them to was in a, a, a changing in the, of the course of their lives and a redirection of their very life. This is the image that I want you to have in your mind. We oftentimes think of the message of Jesus as a candle. The message of God is a candle and it's this wonderful little glowing light. It's this wonderful little glowing image that draws people to it. John the Baptist was a prairie fire. He was not a candle. And he lit the countryside on fire. And the people came. And the people listened. They heard his message and they believed what his message actually was. And this too was the message of Jesus. 
See, here we are talking about the arrival of Jesus. And you've heard from a couple of different people this morning this idea of Jesus coming that first time and Jesus coming that second time. And this last week we even talked about, you know, we begin Advent celebrating the second coming, the second arrival of Jesus. And here we are now looking at what it was that God was doing to prepare people's hearts to receive the message of Jesus. To, to make them ready. Because that's what all that Isaiah passage is about. And that's the quotation in Mark. And uh, you heard Josh read it for you during the worship. It's the same passage that you hear right here. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare His footsteps. All of this stuff. And what's the message? Turn. Turn. The course of our lives must be altered. And this was Herod's perception of Jesus. He even said, after John was dead, at his hands, and he heard Jesus' message, Herod said, that's John again. That's the message of Jesus. Herod had already killed John. And yet that's what he believed when he heard Jesus' message. It was the same message. That there's something about the message that forces us to deal with the course of our life and the direction of our life. Jesus, hearing of John's death, took his disciples and told them that they were going to go somewhere else and so they crossed the sea. And what we see in this gospel is this, the fact that Jesus owed John a funeral. That Jesus owed him a sense of of eulogy. That's what we would call what Jesus does with his words here. And so he said this, in speaking of John, what did you go out to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Is that what you went out to see? No. A prophet? Did you go out in the wilderness to see a prophet? No. Because there was no greater prophet than John. In fact, there has never been anybody born of a woman greater than John the Baptist. That's Jesus' words when he was speaking of John. So here's the deal. Ready? To get to Jesus, we can't avoid John. To get to Jesus, we can't avoid the message that John preached because his message of repentance is absolutely necessary to understand, to receive, and to live in the ways of Jesus. Repentance is crucial. And the biggest thing that we can do in the process is this, is redefine it. You know what? The vast majority in this, of the people in this room are sorry for their sins. Absolutely we are. When I sin, I'm still sorry for my sins. But that's not repentance. Repentance is saying the very course of my life will be altered by the message that I hear. The very course and direction of everything that I do changes. So repentance toward my sin is this. When I sin in this way, I make a commitment to God that I will not walk in that way again. That I will not do the things that caused me to sin. That I will not head in that same direction that resulted in sin last time. You know what? We'll do it again. We'll mess up again. God is gracious. I understand all of that. But we need to get a hold of repentance. And repentance is a change in the course of life. It is a turning away from sin and a turning toward God. And you know what? That message for most of us is a very frightening kind of message. And here's why. Because when we do that, it puts us in the direction of God. It puts us in the direction of God's ways. It puts us in a, a path in our life that is different than anything that we have known before. And there's a very unknown factor to it. That's what John was calling people out in the wilderness to hear. He was calling them from the ways of their life, from the patterns of their life, from the sins of their life, from all of these aspects of their life that were not leading them to God. And he is saying to them, turn, repent. That's why they were being baptized. It marked a moment in their life in which the turn happened. And their life was forever changed. See, everybody, to a degree, 
wants to talk about the presence of God and wants to be in the presence of God. And in other ways, we 